again, my name is Peter Metcalf and I'm the executive director here at Glacier Two Medicine Alliance. And uh, tonight is our uh, wildlife documentary film night it is part of our fall gathering celebration. And as uh, you undoubtedly are aware, our fall gathering has gone online this year, which has allowed us um, to kind of do some things a little differently than we would if we were just in person. Um, and so it's been fun to add this movie night to our schedule. I'm very excited to have Willow Pip with the Me Initiative and filmmaker Daniel Glick here uh, for part of this evening with us as well. Um, if, if you're just uh, coming in, feel free to put your name and where you're from in, in the chat. Um, I just wanna share a couple of announcements before I turn it over and introduce uh, Willow, who's gonna kind of kick off this evening with a little um, presentation about the Me Initiative. Um, First off, uh, if you missed any of our fall gatherings so far, we now have uh, the wonderful presentation that Dr. Christina Eisenberg provided on Friday uh, about her research um, on wildlife ecology in the crown of the continent and, and the, the use of both uh, traditional ecological knowledge and Western science to help better understand and restore these um, critical ecosystems and uh, relationships, human relationships to this land. So that's up on our a YouTube channel. And then on Friday or Saturday night, excuse me, we had a wonderful keynote from uh, Governor Steve Bullock who uh, encouraged and inspired all of us in our work to protect uh, public lands around Montana and clean water and wildlife. So really good Q&A. So you can see that um, on our YouTube channel as well as uh, my annual State of the Badger that uh, we provide about the work of Glacier Two Medicine Alliance. And uh, of course, wonderful music that capped off that great evening from uh, Joey Running Crane. So all that's now up for your viewing as well. And if you haven't been in the auction already, we have our auction fundraiser going. We've got two days to go. Um, make sure you get out there and check out some of the wonderful auction items that we have. Uh, bidding's really been heating up, but we got uh, things for all price ranges and budgets from art and jewelry all the way up to uh, VRBOs and pack trips and um, uh, ski lessons and whitewater rafting and um, you name it, there's probably something in there that might interest you either for yourself or a friend or as a gift. So please go ahead and check that out, bid high and all the proceeds uh, benefit Glacier 2 Medicine Alliance. So tonight we're gonna be uh, looking at a pair of wonderful wildlife documentary films from Daniel Glick. And Daniel Glick's a good friend of our organization. Many of you might be aware of the film, Our Refuge that was made um, about five years ago, uh, five or six years ago now regarding the effort to remove um, oil and gas from the Badger Two Medicine that really chronicled um, the importance of this land to Blackfeet people and their leadership in trying to protect it. And Daniel was a filmmaker on that film, but he's gone on to make a number of other films, um, both locally dealing with Blackfeet led conservation issues, including one we'll see tonight, as well as other wildlife conservation around Montana. And so our first film will be about the ANI initiative. And I'm really excited to have Willow Kip here Willow Kip uh, is the INEA Initiative Coordinator, and uh, she's been with the INEA Initiative since 20, uh, March of 2020, I believe, or 2021, 2020, Willow, um, 2021. And she's gonna tell us a little bit more about this really amazing effort that the Blackfeet has been uh, leading for a little over a decade, about 12 years now, to help restore uh, wild bison to this portion of um, Montana, both as well as the cultural uh, restoration that comes along with this effort. And um, Glacier Two Medicine Alliance has been excited to uh, support this effort that, um, in, is for many years now and are excited about the vision of where the INE initiative is, is taking bison conservation. As many of you know, bison are the only large mammal um, in Montana and really uh, in the United States that uh, is basically uh, hasn't really been restored and uh, scientists consider it ecologically extinct um, in terms of its lost relationships with, with landscape and other animals. And um, this is one of the exciting places, this story here we'll hear a little more about tonight is one of the exciting places where that story is finally starting to change and where we can be hopeful to see this uh, really vital, both ecological keystone and cultural keystone species kind of resume someplace on the landscape. Uh, obviously, bison and restoration and politics is very complicated, especially here in Montana. Um, but it's exciting to see that there is a, some potential to restore this species uh, to some semblance of its uh, native habitat. So uh, very excited to uh, welcome a fellow U of M graduate, Willow Kipp, uh, to share with us about the INEA Initiative. 
uh, this morning or this evening for a few minutes, and then we'll jump into our first film, which is a which uh, chronicles some of that effort. So we'll all go ahead and turn it over to you, and uh, let me know if you still want me to run those slides for you. Great, thank you so much, Peter. Um, if you can go ahead and run the slides, that'd be best. Okay, I will do that for you. And then also, I am a mother. It's after hours, so I'm I'm not alone. <laughs> And this is Gummo Donnie. You'll hear him. He has a lot to say. Okay, I think I'm sharing now. Yep. Okay. I can see it. So you can go ahead and go to the. Do I have power to click to the next or do you? Okay. So my name's Willow Kip. I'm the ENI Initiative Coordinator. Just a little, about, a little bit about the ENI Initiative. We're a collaboration between the Blackfoot Confederacy, which reaches and spans over into Canada, and WCS, the Wildlife Conservancy Society. And through them, my position is created. I'm also in partnered with the Buffalo Program with, through the Blackfeet Nation. And so I work kind of a really unique position. Um, I do a lot of advocating and youth youth community work in the Blackfeet community. I'm based in within the Blackfeet Nation and um, the ENI initiative. This is so these are our goals and what we what we kind of look forward to doing. You can go to the next um, slide, please. Okay. Just a little bit of a visual of the territory if you guys aren't familiar <laughs> familiar with um the blackfoot territory so on this one side i don't know if you guys can see it or just my screen's black on one side um but it says the blackfoot confederacy right here and so this region and ter this is a an example of what our original territory is and then on the other side it, it's a more zoomed out focus um, just to give an even bigger picture idea of what the Blackfeet Nation on the United States side looks like there we go so here's um <clears throat> borders of our original territory on a zoomed out scale and so you can see it's pretty pretty big um, pretty big in terms of just where our migration cycles originally went. So we actually have a fraction of what we original or what we have today. Okay, um, the next slide. I'm going to turn my camera off just for a second. But this is another visual of the Blackfeet of our, this is our annual gathering um this year it was he renamed to healing days but um originally it's the nade north american indian days celebration so this is an aerial view of it and this is our summer gathering that we have in july the second weekend of july every year and so it's oh oh go back yeah thank you sorry <laughs> Um, just a quick point out the Blackfeet on our side, the Blackfeet Nation is 1.5 million acres. We do have five watersheds, which is super amazing. Um, 518 miles of streams, 180 bodies of water, 5, 51,582 acres of wetlands, and 175,000 acres of forest. So that just puts into perspective a little bit um, of what we're working with on our on our on our scale, and that's not including that we're surrounded by Glacier National Park on one side, and then Waterton Park on the Ca Canada side. Okay, you can go to the next slide now. A little bit about our vision. So I mentioned that we're a collaboration with the Blackfeet Confederation and the Wildlife Conservation Society. Uh, we work on cultural and ecological restoration of Eni into, into the Blackfeet Bye. Confederacy. But in order to improve conservation, land, community, well-being, and cultural revitalization, um, it takes a lot of groundwork. And so that's where people like me, specifically me, and then people who are on my team as well, 
um, we, we work on these areas um, to try to get them off the ground and into the community. Okay, next slide. So this, these are our stewardship values. Um, all of our values are looking into them, the Blackfeet ways of knowing cultural, these, these are really broken down into pillars. And, but it's nice to see them. It's nice to see them into our, put into our language. And cause that's a big part of continuing to, continuing to promote what we do and our reason for expanding and promoting Buffalo, being a Buffalo nation, um, a Buffalo people that survived on Buffalo for millennia. And so these are what we put into our values and then putting them are coming from our language. Um, you can go to the next slide. So I mentioned that, that we have pillars or key, key components to what our values are. Some of those broken down um, into separate umbrellas, our environment and Pikani ecology, the Tsitipi culture, which can falls with science and cultural knowledge, collaboration and partnership, Pikani community engagement, co-created solutions, partner and team building, youth engagement, leaders and influencers, and INI. So INIWA, those are, those are, that's at the forefront of our, of our, what we really engage in doing. Um, this is just a nice visual to be able to see what some of those areas are broken down. Okay. <clears throat> so when we're looking at protecting and rewilding buffalo these are some of the motivations behind I, those pillars that we were just looking at um, and then broken down into what catalyzed the ecological and sociopolitical the cultural connectivity to a large landscape conservation um, and at the center of all of these moving pieces, these pie pieces, is diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice. So that's that's the that's the working parts. There's a lot of moving parts to this, but it's really nice to have them broken down into um, a will that's that's conceptual. And then you can go to the next slide. <laughs> yeah wow <laughs> he likes buffalo meat um so we're moving forward constantly moving toward a new a new paradigm and when we're doing this these are some of the ways that we are able to look at and or some of the areas that really just narrowed down into um a lot of those key points that i was talking that were in the will earlier in our values and so within those fall biodiversity natural resources species game and fish um critical a lot or allowable cut um, relations ally alliances medicine abundance reciprocity um, recon reconciliation offerings, taking only what you need, stories and song, that's a huge one. And um, just understanding this, it says sacred law, but cultural values really is what it narrows down to. And so you can go to the next slide. This is this, oh, it kind of looks like it's, um, <sighs> didn't load all the way but this is a map that's really good for referencing just oh did I, get, I got kicked out Shit. i think i can still hear you will i think you're okay oh my gosh i'm yeah i got kicked out for a second i thought i did so this map um don't know why my screen was going funny. So this map is just a refer a good reference of looking at 
what's not doc so i don't think it's loaded all the way but um Well, it's, uh, is it is it this is this what it, it looks I, like on your end i see like um a bunch of documented not documented lands i see but mostly i see like green big green areas of landscape cover and oceanic covers okay yeah so i think this slide is this isn't the original site. I don't know why it's um, doesn't have the lines that connect all of everything that's in the key. So let's just skip this one for now. Okay. Oh, there we go. That's loading. That oh. that's the full slide. <laughs> okay. So these, yes, does it needed the statistics? Um, it says, you know, why indigenous people, why indigenous led conversation? It's really important to have indigenous people leading indigenous conversations for bringing back these species, um, specifically buffalo, into our homes, home landscape. We need to have our people representing um, what's happening on our lands within our our nation. Um, our people have been stewards of this landscape since time immemorial. And so it's really important that we're, we have a voice and a seat at the table when it comes to these indigenous or in, in these um, conservation led issues. And so can I turn up my volume? Yes. My volume should be all the way up. Um, it's important. Indigenous peoples protect 80% of the global diversity on a mere 25% of the planet's land with less than 5% of the world's population. So even though we have the smallest population out of all the populations on this continent, our numbers in protecting the biodiversity, intact lands, um, having resources in space, all um, everything that falls underneath the conservation um, ideal ideal areas is on indigenous people's lands in in Canada and the United States. And so that's a pretty big number. We also lead in a lot of other areas too um, that don't don't cross over into conservation, but you know, looking at specific staying within the conservation, conversation there's you know we our numbers do lead and that's really important to really important to understand and recognize when we're doing this because um sorry a lot of the times the land the conservation work is going to be within reservations okay we can go to the next slide okay working on it <clears throat> maybe um click again and because this yeah there we go yep. oh there it is so this this is just a really awesome quote collaborating with indigenous governments communities and organizations conserves biodiversity while supporting indigenous rights to land sustainable resource and sustainable resource use and well-being um that's really self-explanatory but Again, I just want to point out the importance of collaborating with and supporting our Indigenous communities. We're really lucky here in Montana to have as many federally recognized tribes as we do. I always take for granted the fact that I get caught up in the politics and the, the slow movement of some of our governance systems sometimes that when I go taking when I take a step back and I see the state of other areas with less reservations our federally recognized tribes in the area how much slower their work with with indigenous peoples are and so we're just really lucky to hear in Montana and in Canada to have the large amount of indigenous representation that we do it's important that we continue to highlight and use those voices in all of these conservation issues okay so this map is a map today of the blackfeet this is the blackfeet reservation borders 
Um, the top line is the Canada border. And then to the left in the green um, is Glacier National Park. And so these are just some of the, an idea of how much resources we have on our reservation and in our, in, cause our lands are intact. Um, the green dots are injection well sites, dry hole well leases, oil well leases, gas well lease, and potent, potential gravel sites. So those crude oil, natural gas, and then of course the major roadways. Um, all of these are what large companies and industries see as money signs and they really want to be, or this is what they're looking for to buy into and come and extract. So these are the areas that we really do have to protect. Um, and it makes it that much harder for us to protect it, you know, if we have a money, essentially a money sign on our head. But um, this is just an idea of what we're trying, what we're protecting and what we are doing to conserve. Okay. Um, click it again. Okay, there we go. There's a few more. Okay, there's a couple more underneath. Okay, perfect. Oh, so, so again, these are the threats that we we face. I don't know anywhere in the world that does conservation work that don't face threats. Um, but it's not to say that it makes these threats any less real or any less important. They are extremely, um, what's the word, hazardous, and they 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 would cause a really large um, setback in the conservation realm and the goals that we have set into, you know, just making sure that our kids and grandkids can can enjoy what we have or be able to even see what we have and hopefully even even beyond that have more than what we have and we can leave them a land space that's more intact than what we see today. Um, so these are the fracking and everything that was in the last slide, um, the threats that we face today, okay. But on a lighter note, the conservation opportunities within the Blackfeet Nation are endless. And that makes me super excited because as you can see, this is another key here um, that has tribal lands in pink, the conservation estimates in orange, wetlands in a light green, and, the, and then the three buffalo, where it says buffalo fields, the purple, green, and the, I don't know, it's like a salmon color. Those are our areas where we keep the buffalo. We have two herds here on the Blackfeet Nation, our large herd and the smaller herd, the Elk Island herd. The Elk Island herd is has an amazing story. They are genetically from our area. And so we take a lot of pride in them and care. We take care of both of our herd, herds, but um, we do have a lot of pride in the Elk Island herd just because they are originally from our region and our area. And so they're, they've been a part of our genetics and our and our well-being for generations and now they're finally home. Um, they are kept on to the, the Smith Ranch, which is in the, I guess you, it's not a Kelly green. It's like a, yeah, like a neon green. And um, the other three areas are where the, um, our big herd stays and that, the numbers fluctuate year to year. Right now we're at about 440, 440. Um, head in the large herd and around 88 in the in the Smith Ranch. Don't put that in your mouth. Um, and so that's a big, you know, those are big numbers, especially since it is a dry year. But the big herd, they do they do migrate from each of those fields every year, um, all the way from AMS Ranch to East Glacier and back. And that's a really important part of their well-being of as Buffalo is being able to migrate. So that's exciting. And then also this where it says opportunity. Oh, oh didn't mean to do that. It's okay. Um, I'm just gonna read this. Develop 
develop a Blackfeet conservation area that improves the health and well-being of the Blackfeet people through protection of our lands, livelihoods, and responsible economic development. So all of these areas that are in light purple are in, um, sorry, the goldy color. Those, those are areas that are super important to pay attention to. This one is the one that's at the gold color at the top of the reservation. That's where we are working on putting, bringing back more, um, putting I Buffalo did. hopefully by this time next year, we'll be able to rehome um, our large herd into that field area, which will then span into, it's called the Chief Mountain Lease. And we're working on the first transboundary herd that's going to be able to migrate through Canada into Waterton and then over um, down into uh, Glacier National Park. So that's a pretty special, a pretty special happening that's going to be probably around this. We're hoping for this time next year. Okay. <clears throat> so if you click more. Yeah. yeah, there we go. There we go. There we go. Got it. So this one here, these are from a few years ago of polls that were taken on the Blackfeet Reservation, but since then these numbers have only grown, and I could say that confidently just because the the paradigm around within the Blackfeet Nation about yeah. conservation, mm -hmm. our buffalo being home. Um, and having access to them has has grown. So these numbers have have grown in in a positive light, uh, which at this time though, and I think this is about two to three years old, but seventy seven percent support tribal conservation areas, um, eighty one percent support grassland protection, and eighty nine percent believe conservation creates jobs. So each of those areas you know, we're important because we have one of the largest intact grasslands areas with the, on the North American continent. Um, super important to keep pointing that out and how important our grasslands are. They, they, you know, not just feed our buffalo, but they bring back a variety of species which support each other in a, in a co-management um, system within animals, which is amazing. Okay, and then you can go to the next slide. So just planning for the impact that our plan, you know, of our plans and creating, keeping the synergy, creating synergy, um, conservation, natural resources for tribal environment and well-being, and two, maintaining tribal sovereignty over land and other natural resources for the benefit of the tribe. These are, you know, I, I don't want to say obviously, but they, they are really high level priorities in our work, in our realm, in our workspace, because um, they're at the base of everything that we do. Um, you can go to the next slide. And then this is just how we do that. So planning in Pikani values and stewardship of the land, make, making our plans in a house, which would be in my office. <laughs> um, we collaborate with other people, our partners. We use high quality data, recognize both traditional and modern land use and livelihoods, engage necessary partnerships to plan. Seven, we make sure our plans are in implementable and eight, we learn how to plan better. So each of those I could, would like to talk on more, but essentially I think number eight is one of the most important parts because learning how to plan better and learning how to create things next time and keep pushing at it is super important in conservation and just in the everyday work that we do. Um, there's a lot of different angles and a lot of ground that's being broken that hasn't been touched before, especially when dealing with Buffalo. Um, there's a plan for cattle to Buffalo manage, I say management instead of ranching because Buffalo aren't cattle. You don't ranch them in a sense that 
they are treated like cattle. Um, and so there's ma ma a management plan that's being worked on. There's continuously new studies that need to be need to be put out there and done. Um, we we're continuing we're relearning how to live with buffalo in the short term. And so learning how to redo things better is at the base of this holistic approach in the sense that we're always learning how to make things better and continue to help, you know, spread the word of why Buffalo will need to be in these spaces. Okay. <laughs> and so. Nope. Lulu, I think we may have just lost you. Are you still there? I think we may have lost Willow there on her feed. So while we wait for Willow to rejoin us, um, what we'll do now, Willow, you can interrupt me if you get bumped back in here, but uh, we're just getting to the end of her presentation and about uh, the ANI initiative and the film that we're going to show here in just a moment um, is about the first bison drive. So I think what we'll go ahead and do now while we wait and hope that she can join us and we can catch up with her at the end of the film is I'm going to um, actually key up that first uh, slide. So just give me a minute here. To... I'm back on. Here. I'm nope, sorry. Willow's back on. Okay, Willow, we'll finish up with you. Let's go ahead and finish up and then we'll jump into our first uh, film for the evening. Go ahead. Okay, so if you just, yeah, push play. This is, this is a visual of events that took place this summer. And at the beginning, it has some statistics. I'll just let you read through the statistics, but these are, aerial shots and in the field shots from the events that the the initiative has put on throughout 2021 um and they're on the so just being in this land and in this landscape really puts into perspective how special our homelands are and what we are working continuously day in day out in protecting um i say protecting and not preserving because the land is very alive and so are the tenants and the animals that are being rehomed in this land space um, continuously changing and and so this is just the importance of you know here's some of our numbers for the um, the watersheds that I, I kind of mentioned earlier and then but it's important to just, you know, re-establish these numbers or re-regurgitate re, um, them because this is what we are protecting and what our what were our major goals are. And then, so the Elk Island herd is at 75 right now. Um, 200 in the large herd, we have 287 matriarchs, it's amazing. Buffalo are a more of a matriarchal um, society in within their within their workings they work in family bands and they revolve within family systems and within the larger herd themselves they they mothers teach and protect the the young of the younger the younger um, cows who had who recently had babies um, here's our acreage for the land space that the buffalo have. And so overall, it's 8,895 acres. Um, we're continuously working to expand that, though. That way we can home more buffalo and support more livelihood of buffalo. Willow, would you real quick just explain the difference between the Elk Island herd and the other herd again for those who aren't familiar? Yeah, that yeah, sorry I didn't do that earlier. The Elk Island herd, um, they are a genetically a genetically pure strain of buffalo that are from this area within the black, and when I say this area, I mean the Blackfeet Nation. Um this is our event Eni days this summer, but the Elk Island herd have a really 
special story because in the 1800s, when the, the buffalo were being eradicated from the North American continent as a part of um, the Indian policy of getting rid of us, they, a few, about 50 head were sold down to Flathead area um, to a private rancher. And there they were sold into Canada um, in the Elk Island, which is near Alberta. And they were, they've stayed there and they still have them there, but they stayed there until 2014 when we brought, um, I want to say 40 buffalo calves home to this area, back to their homelands of the Blackfeet Nation. Um, this is part of our panel and working on hide scraping. They're making parched flesh bags like the painted one in the bottom corner. And so the Elk Island herd, that's just some of their significance and why we, we pride ourselves in, in having them home, bringing them back home into this, into the Blackfeet Nation. Um, super, super special, very important. And then the large, the larger herd, um, not to say they're any less special, they really are. And they're an amazing, amazing herd themselves. They just, you know, some of them come from different areas and it's a little bit harder to identify if they have different buffalo species in mixed in with their, with them. Um, but, you know, it's not to say they're any less special. They are just as special and, and just as meaningful. They, they feed and help our people and our community um, tremendously. And so this is some of the on the lands camp that was hosted out by in the Swift Dam area, which is on the southern end of the reservation. And these are just some of the ways in reconnecting our community, our youth into the landscape. Um, it's, I can't, I can't say enough if how important it is when you have buffalo in your land space to know what's in your yard, know what's in your backyard. And so that's, that's just ways of reconnecting into our community back into uh, a buffalo culture. And when I say a buffalo culture, it's really connecting to what our goals and our values are, who we are as an Ixitipi to the core. Um, and so that's, that's what we do when we're, we're, when we have our youth and our community engagement, it's reconnecting with the, with our Buffalo culture. And so here at Eni Days, this is a back and forth um, visuals of Eni Days, our on the land camps and the different things that we hosted throughout this, this year. It's, it's super important just to, you know, have these events and bring our community back together because, well, we're already going into another shutdown with, you know, the pandemic spiking. Um, and so it, it was, you know, it was amazing to be able to have these gatherings this summer while we, while we were able to safely. Yeah. There's Irvin Carlson. He's the director of the Buffalo program. Christina, she's the director of WCS. And there's um, Pete Webster, who's the superintendent for Glacier National Park. All of them attended the uh, Eni Days this year and were able to speak on a panel about Buffalo. And these guys are all Buffalo champions when it comes to um, the work of Buffalo conservation and bringing in um, Buffalo back into the Blackfeet Confederacy. They've, their work is amazing. So that, that was a panel that I, I had the privilege of putting together and bringing all of these people together. Um, I'm just, yeah, they, that was an awesome experience. That's the area of Swift Dam. This is our large buffalo herd being pushed across the fields. They, they move rather quickly. And this is right after a lot of their spring calves were born. And so there was a lot of, a lot of young calves in that visual, which is amazing. And then it's just amazing to see them resting in their natural habitat and landscape. This is their homeland. So they look comfortable. They are comfortable. We do our best to keep them comfortable. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Willow. That's this is wonderful for sharing this with us. 
Thank you guys. And I'm not able to see if it was is we're doing the Q and A right right afterwards or do after the uh, movie. Let's do it right after the movie because I think that'll contribute to the questions some of the people uh, viewers may have. So let's um, unless you have anything else you want to share now, let's go ahead and jump into that film because it's uh, it's wonderful and and I think really captures a lot of um, what you've been sharing with us in terms of the impact it has on people to bring bison home to place and to culture. So what I'm going to do here, um, if you guys have questions for Willow, um, you can go ahead and like uh, start to drop them in the Q&A box at the bottom. We'll get to those as soon as we're done with the video. Um, and then I'm going to go ahead and we will start to film uh, now for us. And um, you'll enjoy it. This movie is about 20 minutes long. It's called Bring Them Home by Daniel Glick. And Daniel will be joining us later this evening to talk about this in his second film. And um, this talks about one of the first drives uh, that they were moving the bison from uh, the Yeni from summer to uh, winter pasture. So I'm going to start the film now for us. Growing up, we, you know, we've all heard about, you know, the buffalo, you know, being so important to the Blackfeet. It was our life way, and we were told that, and I was told that, and I learned that in school, and I didn't know what that meant um, culturally. And so now, um, I feel like, you know, we're getting a little piece of us back. It's an honor, you know, and when I get chances to do this, it's fun. Yeah. You know, it's like, you know, being a part of the uh, Buffalo Drive is, it's more of a uh, honor than anything else. So we move these animals today, uh, get ready to move them back to uh, to the wintering grounds. And a lot of those people that, um, that we do have out there helping, they're um, simply volunteering. They're glad to see these animals back and glad to see a part of our uh, or a big part of our culture, but herding buffalo is a new thing to our people. You know, a decade ago, this wasn't happening. So, you know, hopefully for the next seven generations, you know, we'll keep this herd going, and we'll have thousands out here. Buffalo just started out, you know, charging more or less. Like they were um, really anxious to get, you know, where they needed to go. You know, it's pretty humbling. You know, I used to think that um, just being on horseback alone was safety enough, but it really isn't. Like you have to pay attention and stay back and be alert because they could run, you know, run you down. They need their space and they they demand their space. get started it's um, a little chaotic they're not um, animals to be herded so they're gonna want to go you know where they want to go I wanted to slow down because we had old cows and all that because we had some that didn't cross the highway and they were going crazy they're panicking where's the herd where's the herd so they're gonna jump whatever and that's what happened they start jumping fences it's a tough 
tough day. Yeah, I'm about to come back here. We got him through the first area and we kind of got him pushed into one section and they kind of went through a fence, kind of, yeah, they went through a fence and we got, had to get him the other direction. It was kind of a bit confused at the first. Well, yeah, as you started out, you know, it's it's, it's a little uh, a little rough, a little chaotic, getting them all lined out, like I said earlier. But uh, once we got into the afternoon, it was um, things all kind of smoothed out, and we were able to get going good along the trail, I guess. When you're doing stuff for them, there's. You know, unfortunately, we're going to have, um, you know, some fatalities. She was an older cow and just got a little too overheated and, um, you know, on the rod too much and and, um, and her heart uh, gave up. When she died, then her calf, um, you know, stayed with her and the herd just moved on. Well, the way I look at that is that he realized that his mom died. And the only way he's going to have protection is get back to that herd. And that's the hardest thing on calves is walking away and, and continue staying with that herd because that's their protection. You know, that's the way I look at it. It's just like how we are. You know, we, we get our kids in place to where if something ever happened, they still know what to do, how to take care of themselves to continue to go on with life. I felt bad after she died. Maybe she offered her life to cover everything. Maybe that's what the purpose was for. You know, we can't look at it like it's a bad thing or anything like that, you know, it's, that's life. Being on horseback is better than being a four-wheeler or pickup truck or anything like that. So when the horse is, the horse is running and you're going full throttle on your horse and you got the buffalo beside you and you hear the hoofs just trampling the ground, the adrenaline rush going through your body is just un unimaginable. I mean, that, that, that feeling alone is I get back, I get from back here, back home, back to the reservation. Being a part of this is, you know, a life-changing experience. It has been for me. We have a lot of stories and a lot of um, ceremony that involve the ini. Ini is what people call the buffalo or the bison. To us, it's ini. They taught us what to eat, how to hunt. They were the ones who taught us how to live. You know, I always, I always talk about um, how us as a tribe and Indian people being um, one and the same as, as, as buffalo. The buffalo were killed off to make way, you know, make way for the settlers, for their cattle. And I, and I believe that's the way that it kind of went the same with, with us as Indian people. We needed, they needed to get us out of the way, both the buffalo and the Indian, to, to make way for the settlers to come in here. And buffalo now, are, uh, they're restricted to areas. Um, you see all the other wildlife, elk, deer, they can come and, come and go as they please, everywhere. But uh, buffalo, they won't let them come and go as they please. And that's the way they were with uh, 
in our beginning was put on reservation. We weren't allowed to leave, and so we, we had that same same fate. And today, the challenge is not how Eni takes care of us, but how we're going to take care of Eni. We tend to talk about Eni as part of our past, but he's very much part of our future. And the second day, old man Winter came knocking at the door a little early and stuff. And so we all had to get geared up and we actually got a chance to, uh, you know, battle the elements. The weather was bad, but I can't say it. it's bad because I will not hold them in a, in, a, in a field more than longer than two days. If it was storming like crazy, I'd still have to keep pushing them. Because if I don't, they're going to go themselves. They're not going to wait for us. They're just going to continue going. Then that's where you end up with people hitting them with cars. So that's why I just kept pushing. Coming out here, and it's hard work, but I, I love that part. Last night, I felt like a Mack truck hit me when I <laughs> sat down and relaxed for a few, but it was really rewarding, and it was a good feeling. The buffalo has been really key in uniting our community and, such, and affecting us in such a positive way. For this certain time of, of bringing these animals back and forth through the winter, and, in summer uh, uh, ranges, it brings people together and creates that community uh, togetherness. These animals created that. They've created a lot of things along the way that I've seen. I feel like they're like hurt because we have to pen them. It's just a natural thing in their mind that they roam wherever they wanted to go back then. You know, nothing stopped them. And if they didn't have fences here, they'd already been home a month ago. And they'd already be working their way back up here just for the heck of it. That's, that's really how Buffalo should be, is to be able to uh, roam free just like other wildlife and we want to see buffalo accepted like that to be wildlife as they should be and be able to roam you know it might not ever be but uh, it's kind of always been a big dream of mine is to, that to happen when we get to the gate we'll have somebody at the gate to open it and then the only thing that you have to do is just, just yell out of gate. If you yell out of gate, they know to go through that gate. Huh? And I just remember what Landon said yesterday. He prayed, he said, it's five feet. Pray that everybody is safe. Nobody gets hurt.
I hear stories about how like the older people would always say that the buffalo would never come back. And I know they, because they were part of that era where there were no buffalo here on the reservation. Now, you know, just buffalo conservation is happening everywhere and it really gives us hope. I always have that feeling of, I want to be a part of helping make things better, you know, for our people. And now helping make things better for our buffalo. It's a real big thing for me, and now a lot of our people, to, uh, to actually see them buffalo back here on our lands, where they were gone for so many years. And then my thought is that um, I want to see them here on this land, you know, for you know, generations to come for all of my, my kids, my grandkids, my great grandkids. You know, I want them animals to be here for the, our future generations. Well, hello everybody, thank you. That was fabulous. Uh, I just love seeing that film about uh, the Blackfeet uh, Bison Drive. And so I'm gonna invite Willow to come back on here and we can, uh, we have about 10 minutes so we can chat and um, answer some questions that you may have for her um, uh, about that, um, about the, the initiative or anything that came up during the film. So we'll invite Willow to come back and join me here. If you got questions, feel, drop, feel free to drop them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we'll do our best to get those over to um, um, Willow. So, but Willow, I just um, want to start with, I guess, a question that uh, comes up when I watch that movie and, and I think about, uh, you know, the conversation we had earlier tonight about, you know, the, 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 the long-term kind of goal of uh, restoring some free roaming bison to the to the area, so I mean me. Um, and Sheldon talks on the pen how in the movie how he doesn't, you know, wishes they doesn't have to pen the bison, but um, they do right now. And so I'm just kind of curious how how the animals are are managed in a way that um, if you could talk a little bit more about that management, that seasonal management that takes place and efforts to kind of protect those kind of wild characteristics that um, the animals brought with them from, from Elk Island when they came back to, to Blackfeet country. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for, for asking that question. Um, okay, making sure my mute is off. Um, yes, yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. And, you know, it really is important. I mentioned earlier, Buffalo culture. 
And when I when I say Buffalo culture, I'm I'm referring to both how we connect with Buffalo as humans, but also are as Blackfeet in the Blackfeet Nation, but also how Buffalo reconnect with themselves. You know, that's something that's super, super important to just, we, we, it's easy to forget, I should say. And that's because we get caught up in, you know, doing all of the work of making sure they have land space and, um, they're, you know, they have just a place to be and live. Uh, that's a really big worry that we, you know, that's on our plate in the first place. And so, you know, be, not thinking about, not thinking about their culture kind of can, can get overclouded sometimes with that. But, um, you know, just some of the things that we do to try to help keep themselves, help themselves reconnect with themselves in a sense is, you know, almost like, I don't want to say no management, but we do, you know, the less people to people contact is more so in a sense, better for them. Um, I'm sorry, but <laughs> he has a lot to say too, but, um, yeah, that's that's what I have to say about that. Yeah, sure. And and a, along those lines, um, I have a question here, uh, and you kind of touched about on this just briefly in the in the presentation. But uh, the question is, where do the where do the the Biden spend the winter? And because I know you're moot there, we're flying, watching them move in the in the film, and 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 I believe there's both some summer pastures that are used, and then also some some winter pastures. And uh, you want to just ex clarify a little bit more for our audience, kind of what where they were being moved from, you know, from point A to point B, and kind of how that um, is determined. Yeah. So um, they the big herd is the herd that moves migrates from the AMS Ranch in the winter time, which is the biggest land space. Um, I had the numbers on one of the slides, and I don't have it off the top of my head, but that's the biggest land space that is underneath the Buffalo program for set aside for Buffalo. Um, and then from there in the winter, they get pushed into, we call it the duck field, but that's um, another land space that's just off of highway two. And it's right across the highway from um, the Elk Island herd. And then in the early or yeah, then, early summertime after the duck field, they finish getting pushed up to the East Glacier pastures. And there's two there and they stay there for the summer, remainder of the summer. And they're just right off of the highway um, on both sides of the road there. And then after late summer, so right now they're back in the duck field. Um, Years like this year when it's especially dry and kind of a harder year for feed, um, they did have to come into the the uh, Smith Smith Ranch field area, and they shared some of the land space of the Elk Island herd, um, which is fine. And then after that, they go back into the duck field, and then late fall when before before the snow falls hopefully sometimes um that doesn't happen and the snow falls right away when we get an early early winter um but then we'll push them back to the ams ranch and so they do have their migration path and they it's kind of nice that they know their migration they they tell us when they're ready to go um Irvin mentioned that in the film too you know, that they, they, they let us know when they're ready to move. And when they're ready to move, we got to be ready to move with them. There's not really, um, you know, it's, it's a way different in a sense of, you know, cattle, we can let them move on their, you know, set a date and move the cattle uh, to, from one field to another. Buffalo aren't like that. We have to be prepared with them. And so, yeah, that's kind of, kind of the, did I, did I, yeah. Is that the question? Yeah, that was really helpful. Um, and and uh, along those along those lines, another question in from the audience here from um, Elizabeth is: uh, have, is 
the land manager seen any changes in terms of species composition or um, other changes um, on lands where bison are, are grazing compared to prior to, to um, putting a knee back there on, the, on those lands? So let me rephrase, um, yeah. just is, has there been any alterations in the species genetics since being in the land space? No, I don't, I, I think the question is about like species composition, like are you seeing changes in the grasses or the forbs or mm. shrubs or anything like that as a result of having the bison grazing? Yeah, so definitely there's quite a few studies that are continuously happening on the health of the grasslands and the and the ecological growth succession. Um, I think the best example is from the Smith Ranch where the Elk Island herd, sorry, the Buffalo Sp Spirit Hills Ranch where the um, Elk Island herd stays. And it was given that name after um, by an elder that so now has a traditional name as the, as the Buffalo Spirit Hills Ranch where the Elk Island herd stays, um, just so I can clear that up. And then, but yeah, the their area and their field is probably the best example of plant life and plant species coming back at a variety. Something that was just pointed out to me the other day, which is super amazing, is since buffalo are, are brought back into our landscape, a lot of other species, animal species that haven't, don't really come into the area as often are starting to come back a lot more. Like just the other day, there was a herd of antelope and they're a very big species compared to a lot of the smaller species. So it's like a trickle chain effect mm -hmm. that they have in their area. Um, so there was antelope over on Spring Hill just this week which people don't normally see. Um, so that tells me that if other animal species are coming back into the area, especially that big and grazers, that the plant species and the plant, like the soil health itself is doing relatively well. Um, there have been uh, studies done this summer by MSU and BCC. We collaborate with them. Um, just to have, you know, they have interns come out and they, they do a lot of field studies on the soil and grass health themselves. And so when they get those done, we get reports back on what their findings are. And those are always super interesting just because, you know, sometimes you get, you, you don't expect what you're, what you're going to get. And I'm, you know, every time they tell you that the soil health is better where the buffalo are kept opposed to somewhere where there's not buffalo and there hasn't been buffalo for a few generations, you know, that makes, makes us happy because that's, you know, telling us that we're doing what we're supposed to be doing and managing our landscape and trying to rejuvenate, revitalize all of this, all of this work that we're doing is important, right? And that it's meaning something. Um, yeah. So like just again, the, the uh, Buffalo Spirit Hills Ranch, looking at their field, there's a lot, there's about 60 different plant species just when you walk out there. Um, and that's a really good sign because I know that Buffalo selectively graze, which is super cool. And um, I'm kind of a nerd about it. So, <laughs> but yeah, they selectively graze, which is unique and just shows that how long they've been on this in this area and evolving with the landscape to be able to know how to selectively graze right mm -hmm. so that's a really awesome that was an awesome question thanks yeah you're welcome and we got time for just one more one more question here and it's um, kind of a forward-looking question you've made um uh, touched on this briefly but i think as well in your presentation about kind of what's coming next and and you know where do you see the the you know the, the most hopeful opportunities towards um, advancing uh, the goals of of having a uh, you know free roaming you know buffalo or a more of a less of a fenced herd um, in the near future? What if any opportunities do you see coming? 
So yes, that's that's a good question. We I mentioned the Chief Mountain area earlier in my presentation, and that's probably the biggest thing that's on our front burner right now. And that is securing the leases that are at the base of Chief Mountain. Chief Mountain is, if you're not familiar, is um is one of the most sacred mountains we have. That it's the and when I say we, I, I mean everybody, <laughs> just because of its peer system and placement and everything about it. It's the head of, it's right at the very front of the Rocky Mountain front. It sits right on the border of Canada and um, the United States, right at the edge of Blackfeet territory. Half of it's in, on, located on the Blackfeet reservation, the other half is located within Glacier National Park. And so a lot of a lot of unique qualities to it. But at the base of it is where we're looking at um, securing leases to rehome a large amount of buffalo. And right now it's looking great because I mentioned the transboundary herd. If we are able to place them back in that area there they have the opportunity to be able to migrate into Canada, which is Waterton, um, the Waterton National Park, and then back down south to Glacier National Park. This will be the first herd to be able to do that of its kind um, anywhere that I know of, and definitely the, the largest space to do that as well. There's you know nowhere else on the continent that's that's doing this kind of work or have has this kind of um, I guess agenda like we do and so that's what makes it special as well and then if they're able to do that and work through the, the boundaries like that on their own that's going to be a huge step within buffalo culture for them reclaiming their own identity and reclaiming their own sense of well-being and being able to move freely like that. Yeah, well, that's super exciting, Willow, and I really hope that uh, that can come to pass. And and um, excited to be this, this to see this vision. Um, yeah. My first met Pete Nani at Wildlife Conservation <laughs> Society, and and um, um, and others uh, about ten years ago to see where we're, we're starting on this process. It's really exciting to see where it's coming, and and I'm just really grateful for. Um, you being here tonight to share with us a little bit about the work that you're doing now that you're at the reins of is the, uh, of the knee initiative and look forward to staying in touch and um, and I know that a lot of people are really excited and rooting for what's going on and are interested to know how they can help support this so um, thank you so much for being here with us tonight and sharing this exciting story of the work that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you everybody for, for bearing with me and 